Good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us uh, this morning. It is 10.02 on my, on my clock. Uh, welcome to the Friday SLO Talk. My name is Jarek Yanyo. I'm the founder of the Friday SLO Talks. I am a pleasure to be joined by the uh, California Assessment Coordinators Hub, or coaches for short, who are going to help moderate the discussion. Coaches, would you please uh, introduce yourself? Um, Amanda, you're, you're, you're first on my screen. Hi, everybody. I am the faculty coordinator of instructional design and outcomes at Reedley College, a Central uh, Valley Community College right in the middle of the uh, California Valley. Enrique, you're next. Good morning, everyone. My name is Enrique Jauregui. I'm in the SLO coordinator for Fresno City College uh, right in the Central Valley of California. Welcome. And Trisha. Good morning, everyone. My name is Trisha Wilging. I am uh, a faculty member in the reading and teacher preparation department at Long Beach City College, and I'm also the college's uh, SLO coordinator. All right. Good morning. Thank you again for joining us. Before we begin, I just would like to remind everyone to introduce themselves in the chat. Please post any questions that you may have for our guests, and if you wish to speak during the presentation, don't hesitate to raise your hand. Uh, contact one of the coaches, myself, to articulate the question or a comment for you. Uh, we also have a Padlet in the background, so if you wish to post more questions or suggest answers, please make sure that you take a look. Amanda is going to put a link to, the, uh, to Padlet in the chat momentarily. Um, finally, uh, we may have uh, a lot of attendees this morning. This, uh, this uh, uh, talk is, is uh, uh, quite, quite popular. The, the topic is quite important to many people. Uh, so those who are coming late will be able to watch the live webinar just outside of the main room, so to speak. Uh, again, if there are any technical issues, please contact us. We'll be happy to, to help you to address them. Our guests today are higher education practitioners whose work is focused on program coordination and institutional effectiveness. Uh, Dr. Tara Brand Edwards is an assistant professor and program coordinator at National Lewis University in Chicago. And Dr. Aaron Zentner is a Dean of Institutional Effectiveness Research and Accreditation at Coastline College in Southern California. Aaron is also an Associate Professor of Data Science and Data Analytics at National University. Welcome to both of you. Thank you very much for agreeing to share your expertise with us today. Tara and Aaron, would you like to say more about who you are? Go ahead, Tara. Oh, oh, I'll just say that um, as a faculty member, I've been kind of tasked with um, being the lead of the program assessment process at the university. And that is um, not necessarily something I signed up for explicitly, but it's the role I ended up in. And so I've kind of taken it on and it's been um, quite an interesting journey to really dive into this process and to support the faculty and the university in this way. Excellent. And, and through my perspective, working with uh, two-year and four-year institutions, looking at program assessment review, and really taking that process from something that's, what would you say, more or less things that you need to do for accountability purposes to a meaningful practices. And once again, we have a great story to tell today. And so, Yarik, uh, if you'd like to kick us off with the first question. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. So um, in, in preparation for, for our uh, talk to, uh, today, we have agreed that we are going to have a conversation. So again, I would really encourage you to post questions because, again, most of us, if not all of us, are familiar with the with program review. This is this is not uh, anything that's that's necessarily new to us. It's just that the program review as a process is always seems to be always evolving. There is always new data, new information, new guidelines, uh, new ways for us to respond to the uh, to the guidelines and accreditation demands. And we do it in a variety of ways that do vary from institution to institution. Our um, task today, as it always is, is to learn from one another. And that's why we have experts who are ready to answer our questions. Uh, and let's let's go ahead and get started on this then. So uh, in your estimation, to, to uh, this is for um, Tara and Aaron, for, for both of you, and you're certainly welcome to ask questions of the audience as well. Um, what exactly is your level of involvement in program review? If you could please uh, tell us that. And then also um, 
perhaps from the broader picture, from your perspective, what is the purpose of the program review? Aaron, please take it away. So we'll start with purpose and and then go into to my current role and there's just my experience with that. And then Tara, you can jump back and forth and share yours as well. So we'll really go back to the purpose of program review and a continual cyclical quality improvement, improvement of how we engage students, support learning, understanding what's happening with our curriculum, our programmatic um, experiences, and also looking at the learning outcomes. You know, we've seen as, as York had alluded to that it's going from really an accountability approach to really an action planning document. You know, in the past, it would just be something to check some boxes and, you know, look at a little piece of data here and there. But as we're looking across institutions, two-year and four-year institutions, there are a lot of integration points throughout the college that feed into the program review. And in the past, it used to just be, okay, we're going to look at curriculum, going to look at SLOs, and going to make some uh, laundry list of items I need to make my program better. But really shifting that mindset and really making it meaningful has been a really core aspect of, of myself and all of my colleagues across the state, at least in California, to say, how can people do this and bring their passion into this? And I feel that that's some of the key aspects of maybe what we can share today of what does that mean? You know, and so as a snapshot of what I can give is, you know, we talk about integration of data points. And, and stories. And once again, I look at program review as the opportunity to tell your program story. While you live in the sphere of your program, not everybody does. And there's a lot of opportunities for cross, cross collaboration with peers, colleagues, programs, departments, uh, internal or external to your institution. And I think with that, what data are you looking at? Is it quantitative mm -hmm. data, qualitative data? Is it faculty feedback? And doing it not just as a data autopsy, to be like, this is what happened. Here's a report of what happened. But how does that inform what I'm looking to do? Thinking of things which has been popular topics like chat GPT. How is that falling, finding its way? Not writing your reports. I mean, I tried it. It didn't work too well. My report was terrible. But really thinking about how do we leverage new technology? How do we bring in different aspects and really focus on how do we create that new and evolving student learning experience through our programs? Mm. And so I think those are some key elements is when you start examining, questioning, looking through your program review, you know, are we, and so I'll, I'll give an example for Coastline. Uh, we're just going through our, our review of our update of our process. We've aligned them to the new 2023 um, accreditation standards that are coming out soon. Following up with that, instead of saying like, what did you do? Give us this assessment. There's three critical areas across the entire institution with like a resource effectiveness, programmatic development that talks about how are you achieving equitable outcomes? What are your promising practices? How, and really using it as a venue to share and to analyze that. And then following with that is, once again, what are the next steps in your evolution? And I think those are the key things that really prompt individuals to really think outside the box to just do instead of, hey, we're going to keep doing everything we're doing. We're doing the curriculum review. Well, what's next? How do we differentiate and grow as institutions? And I think that's in, in the highly competitive um, higher education market we're in right now where everything's so up in the air. How do we re-envision ourselves? And I think program review is that vehicle by which we can drive to that destination. So with that, I'll pass it over to Tara. So um, when I think about the program re review process, what comes up for me is just, it's an opportunity to really look at both quantitative and qualitative data to better understand the needs of our students specifically, as well as just understanding the performance of the program. Um, additionally, we really, um, in my program and I, how I see the process in general, is also using it as an opportunity to use the findings and the feedback you may get about those findings to improve. Again, the student experience, student uh, performance, as well as again, the overall functioning of the program. Um, and finally, just making sure that we're um, engaging various stakeholders and that's internal stakeholders such as uh, various administrators within the institution, as well as looking at um, working with the faculty within a program and looking at external stakeholders. And I, because my program is a counseling program, we work extensively with stakeholders, external stakeholders in order to secure um, learning experiences for our students through internships. 
So having those individuals involved and understanding how to integrate them into the process is really important. Um, and finally, just there's that piece um, for accountability, right? It's if we say something is important in our program, we really need to develop a strategy for measuring it and tracking it and then following up with um, solutions to address any issues we find and to just improve and enhance the overall functioning of the program. I think you bring up some great points, Tara, with that, especially with the accountability piece. Many of our colleges do surveys. I'm sure all of mm -hmm. you do surveys, you send them to students, but and employees, colleagues, external, internal. The question is, is always the why. Think about that, how they feed into program review. Why am I asking someone a question? Am I giving them false hope to be like, hey, what's, what's your consideration of X, Y, and Z for these amazing activities? And people are like, oh my gosh, we may get these activities. And it was just a cool story, right? And so how do we get from the cool stories to actions? And I think that's really, as we have more and more connectiveness with our communities and um, our students and our colleagues, making that available in program review, spelling out what we're going to do. Because what I always talk to my colleagues is about is imagine if we all win the lottery, like the bazillion dollar lottery, and then we leave. Where's the plan for the future? You know, the plan isn't let's just keep doing the same thing we're always doing. You know, how can they continue the work? And I've seen it a lot of institutions, sometimes the department chair, sometimes it's a dean. Um, certain areas may have one person right program review in, in the instructional side. And how do we engage that type of feedback? And we're seeing that more community-based approach where some institutions do it at discipline level, like you may have like accounting, business management, uh, marketing, all do individual program reviews. And then we have others doing a larger scale one over, the, of over business management operations where you have cross-functional faculty working together in a more productive manner in a collaboration for a bigger need trying to be met. And so I think that's also an evolution. And for me, to answer your, your first part of your question, Yarek, and then uh, Tara can ask, um, my involvement is not just only the, the, the co-chair of program department review at, at my college, but also being a key contributor and supporter of faculty through training, through mechanisms, at helping them define questions. It's while we always try to give like a really like super streamlined template, we also want to give the autonomy to individuals to help them tell their story. So being the facilitator of that and really enabling faculty is the key aspect is we don't want to hinder their experiences or perspectives. We want to engage that because I think as we start innovating and changing what we're doing, that's the core facts is the diversity of thought, perspective, culture, mindset into those practices and really encouraging that as you're developing out your templates, your processes, your timelines and thinking about that. And so that's really my involvement at that level and go ahead Tara if you want to share yours your involvement you touched on it a little bit but yeah absolutely so um again as a faculty member um when I initially kind of came on board at my institution I knew and I was aware of various ways that we gather data um everything from I'm um, looking at course or instructor data on how well they're performing um in classes as well as how our students are performing on their key assessments or the, the assessments we use to track their progress over the duration of their time in the program. And then um, I kind of, you know, got pulled into this assessment piece, so to speak, um, because we do, you know, we need faculty to be involved in that part of the process. And so I became one of those faculty members to do that. And in that process, um, I have been kind of working with the administrators and our assessment team members who at the university level that are in place and many of them serving in the role such as Aaron, you know, who are really there to provide us with the tools and the resources to um, really understand what we want to know about our programs and how to gather and analyze that data. And so um, I work with the individuals in our assessment department as well as um, various administrators in the university to, to just kind of understand at the university level, what is it that would be useful for them, for the university to, to know and understand about our program, but also drilling down into the needs that are set forth, but based on our accreditation and what kind of data points and data do we need to gather in order to demonstrate that our program is functioning in a healthy way. And so um, my role has been to kind of work with those different groups as well as the faculty 
to collect the data, like figuring out the best of tools and places to collect the data, as well as figuring out, you know, the cadence of collecting that data and also doing the analysis and then sharing out through various reports of kind of where we are as a program along those various data points. Uh, so that's, you know, pretty much essentially my role is kind of this um, bridge between the administrative functions in that data collection and processing um, strategy and the faculty who are often in a position to um, kind of make sense of that information and to also uh, support our program's um, ability to kind of effectively respond to what comes out of that data and not just having a ton of data and, and looking at it and, and, and storing it somewhere, but really making it um, useful. I think I just want to build off of what Tara said. So first of all, Tara, I have a colleague that's that's just has the same role as Tara, a couple of them at my institution. It's amazing. Like I said, talking faculty to faculty, being able to share their experiences and guide individuals. You touched on a really few good points about how do we communicate? It's always that idea. You may write this amazing program review. You're like, check out this entire book I put together. But how do they know? How do your colleagues know, you know, you may have the best ideas in the universe, the most amazing promising practices, but how are you sharing it? You know, I think Terry, you brought up, how do you communicate that? And, you know, I've seen amazing practices from my colleagues at other institutions where they actually have segmented time, like, and we're going to adopt that at our institution coming up this year, where we have a segmented day where um, individually programs and departments can come give a short snippet like a 15 minute snippet where anybody from the institution can come and see and learn and understand and then how are they informing the planning process and things of that magnitude so really building community around program review is something that's going to be key i think in strengthening that and building those meaningfulness but some of the one of the questions that we had is it's in the chat right now is well it's about to be in the chat is at your institutions if you could take two to three words to describe your program review, maybe if you could put those in the chat, we'll skim through those and, and then maybe have some comments on that. So please feel free to to respond to, to the question in the chat. Aaron, uh, yes. sorry to interrupt. We also have the uh, Padlet, Padlet too. Yes. Does, does it have the same question on the Padlet? We can do that if you want to. Let's just do it in the chat because we're, we're going to do a multimodal play approach with this. So we'll start with the chat and then so we have a few people in flux comprehensive and and I think one of the things I really like the concept of comprehensive. You know when anybody writes a thesis or a dissertation the first question someone asks you typically is how long was your dissertation? You're just like pause couldn't you just ask like what the topic was, you know, what's the context. And I think when individuals have like 800 questions to answer, is that meaningful? No. Is that impactful? No. And if you have five minutes to do it, does it provide thoughtful feedback? So sometimes comprehensive doesn't mean good, you know? And so I think that's something, and Tara, I don't know what you want to share on, on your thoughts on that as well. I'm really glad you brought up that point, just how it could be really tempting to just measure everything and collect a ton of data. It would feel really ambitious and, and like, wow, we're just we're getting all of this information. But what we're really trying to be conscientious about is just being really intentional about what do we think is something that's really meaningful and something that we can act on once we receive that data and we're able to kind of look at, you know, again, what needs emerge from that uh, and, and also just pacing ourselves too, because I think sometimes it could, you could feel like a bit of a weekend warrior, kind of like at the gym, like I haven't been to the gym in 20 years and now I go six days a week and I do all body parts at the same time. And it could be really tempting to kind of take on that approach. And that could really also overwhelm people and overwhelm the systems of support we actually have. And in overwhelming those systems, it means that like we're likely to not maybe achieve the, our objectives in gathering the data in this thoughtful way we intended. And also just, you know, I really, um, as a faculty member, just emphasize just how the faculty members are engaged in that process. And, and for many people, this is not necessarily their priority, right? It, they, they see it as important, but there are other things that they're, that they're more concerned about 
And if we create such a burden where they're really overwhelmed and stressed out, we kind of discourage them a little bit from really being actively engaged in a process. And so in order to kind of help people feel like they can contribute and they can be engaged, we want to be mindful of how we're pacing the work too. So I'm going to throw it over to Enrique because I really liked your comment, tax audit. Help me understand. What do you mean by that? That's funny. <laughs> oh, my God. It's just, more, it's, you know, it's an intensive process. Let me use for the lack of better words, intensive. That is, uh, it feels like, you know, you're going to the IRS and it's, 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 it's a crazy process. I don't want to be a bad mouthing, you know, some other uh, process, but it's, it's, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll stick it to those words only. <laughs> oh, to- totally makes sense. And I think that is sometimes the fear associated with doing a program review, because what if you're not doing good? What if you don't have graduates? What if your curriculum is old? What if you're teaching like typewriting, like typewriter, not typewriting, but actual typewriting repair? Is that a thing? You know, and sometimes it's scary to look at ourselves to be like, is this okay? Can it be okay? And I think in the empowering others to say, it's okay to give a realistic perspective, but what are you going to do? You know, you could have like a type, you know, a, a typewriter repair program and be like, you know, it's time to sunset that. Here's the direction we're going to go. Let's think outside the box. How can we leverage the great experiences that they probably made for the students, but put them more in a relevant program? And so once again, it doesn't have to be a detrimental. And I feel sometimes individuals are like, oh no, you're going to close my program. Or they paint it in a picture where sometimes the realities by which we operate in aren't, aren't maybe specified. And so I think some of those challenges and the, the ideal state is to really create that space where faculty feel comfortable and confident to utilize that data to tell their story in an accurate manner, but without um, the the fear of something happening to their program, but then also the opportunity. And I think this opens up a little bit. And I don't know, Tara, we didn't really talk about this, but uh, I'll, I'll throw a random question to you is, ha- in, historically, I've seen a lot of program review being associated with resource allocation. And someone's like, what do you need? And then basically, you just like Google like everything I need and just make a list. Like I've been to colleges that literally have a thousand things, literally a thousand that they want but there's no purpose behind them. Like we need Lambos, we need this. And they missed the point of what purpose. And, and at our institution, one of the things we did, we, we lived that life. Like every going through 500 things, do you need these like, I don't know, typewriters? I'm, I don't know why I'm a typewriter kick, but basically do you need these right now? But shifting that mindset to planning to say, what initiatives or what plans do you have? And thinking about the idea of like accreditation with resource effectiveness of, What's the total cost of ownership? So for example, you're like, we need a full-time faculty member to do what, right? Well, to teach classes. Okay, that's good. So let's talk about that a bit further. What's the initiative? You know, we want to build a program, a curriculum, teach classes. Okay, cool. That's what you're trying to do. Now, what do you need to get there? And say, if it's in physics, we're like, okay, well, it's not just a faculty member. Like you you hire a faculty member, you don't have a physics lab, guess what? They're just going to be hanging out in a room talking about physics. It won't be fun. So when you think about that, What's the total cost of that where, you know, you have a physics lab, physics equipment, physics um, supplies, you need an office, you need technology, you need professional development training, you need the faculty member, the curriculum. When you think of that, that total cost of ownership, it really goes back to the initiative by which you want to achieve, because therefore, if you're lacking those individual things in your planning, will it come to fruition to the ideal state that you're trying to achieve? The probability of occurrence is no. But I want to go over to my colleague, Tara, to hear her thoughts, or anybody else can put their thoughts in chat or raise their hands about resource allocation tied to program review. Let's go ahead, Tara, please. Yeah, so absolutely. I do believe there is kind of, there's some anxiety, you know, in the faculty when it comes to, hey, how, you know, we need something, we want something for the program, and how the program review process might impact that. Um, and I would say um, those have been concerns. But the concern that came up for us particularly was around accreditation. And it was, and it was specifically around how are, you know, how is your program kind of in this really strategic and systematic way um, addressing diversity, equity, and inclusion issues. That was really kind of what came up for us. 
And, and we had to really look at ourselves and you mentioned earlier, Erin, and I appreciate the fact that you mentioned it, how it could be really intimidating to look at your program and see somewhere where it has fallen short of your expectations, or maybe it's not necessarily um, clearly addressing a need. And that can feel really scary and, and make folks feel really vulnerable. And it takes a lot of courage to kind of look at that and look at those needs and then start the process of trying to take action. But it, it first starts with the courage to actually look and see what's there. And that includes collecting the data so you know what's happening. And so I would say for our program in particular, that was kind of what came up for us, like, whoa, how are we addressing this? And, and we had to really look at our program and ourselves and develop a strategy. And and one of the things that, that I, just in our collaboration between Tara and myself over the last couple of weeks with Yarek, you know, did an amazing approach really sharing the program with you. And I don't know, Tara, if you wanted to share that with us and maybe walk us through some of those processes, if you wanted to share a PowerPoint or anything to just share with, with the community about this. Absolutely. Absolutely. So I'll go ahead and share. Okay. So what you know I'll talk about here is just again, as I mentioned before, what came up for us is how are we as a program really in this kind of clear, cohesive, systematic way addressing diversity, equity, and inclusion um, in our program. And some of the areas we um, identified where we could start to collect and really look at the data um, included um, the key assessments in our program and our key assessments are basically um, these assignments that are embedded in specific courses that measure and track our students progress over the duration of the three year program. And so starting from their first quarter in the program, they have courses, at least one course that is tracking that, you know, through a specific assignment, how they're performing. And then there um, we have kind of the course instructor evaluations and everyone is kind of familiar with that process, how at the end of a term, a semester or a quarter, students are um, asked to provide feedback, you know, about like how their experience of a course or of an instructor. So that's another area where we decided to uh, collect data. And then we have the evaluation of internship site supervisors. And as I mentioned earlier, as a counseling program that is um, training our students to provide mental health services, we need for them to get hands-on experience in providing those services to real human beings, real people. And in order to do that, we've established partnerships with various organizations and schools throughout the state that um, where, where our students, they spend anywhere between 15 and 20 hours a week at those sites providing counseling services. And so the people who supervise them in that site, they're really an extension of us because they're an extension of the learning environment because they are giving our students feedback. They are providing our students with learning experiences. And so we wanted to evaluate them in that way as well. And then we have persistence and graduation rates. Um, this is where we really look at how our students persist from term to term in the program. Uh, our program is set up in a cohort model, which means whenever they start the program, the group of students they start the program, that is the group of students they graduate with. So it's like a family, a support system. And so they graduate, they work, they attend all of their classes within their cohort. And if they take a term off or fail a course, they get pulled out of the cohort because they're out of, they now they have to maintain the sequence of courses. So that's a persistence um, dynamic that we look at. Like if that happens, a student doesn't pass or withdraws from a course, they're now not persisting till the, to the next term with their cohort. And then that inevitably impacts graduation rates because they may have anticipated graduating at a certain period of time with their cohort, but if they're out of sequence, they're actually put into a different cohort that graduates after or later than their previous cohort. And then finally, we have um, diverse instructor tracking. And this is where we look at 
just the diversity of our instructors, our faculty and adjuncts, and making sure and, and, and looking at, are we providing our students with opportunities to learn from a, a variety of instructors that have um, a wide range of lived experiences, life experiences and perspectives on the work. So again, those are kind of the key areas where we decided to collect this data. And with our key assessments, again, these are embedded in all of the courses. Uh, our goal was for 80% of the students to score 80% or higher on those key assessments. And if the students fell below that benchmark, then they did not you know, uh, pass the course. Like if they get less than 80%, which is a B, they didn't pass the particular assignment. And what we found is that um, as an aggregate, we achieved that benchmark. Over 80% of our students scored 80% or higher on their key assessments. However, when we started to disaggregate that data um, by campus, um, major, and um, among demographic groups, what we found is that there were some performance gaps among students. And that um, being able to look at that disaggregated data provided us with an opportunity to really look at, hey, what can we do to better support those students? Um, but first, one of the things we did is um, we asked the instructors to really follow up with the students who didn't pass and to have conversations with them around kind of what was impacting their performance on those assignments mm -hmm. during that term. And what, and what we found after we, the instructors had those conversations is these are the kind of issues that came up and these students said that this impacted their performance. So one of them um, was personal health issues. This is mental and physical health. Some of our students, um, you know, maybe had, you know, choir, you know, like during COVID, you know, there are issues around that, but also just a variety of health issues that they would have. And also um, some of our students had family issues and it may be that their family members were having health issues or just needed some type of support and their attention went towards dealing with their health issues or dealing with their family issues as opposed to attending to their schoolwork. Um, also, some of the students reported that they had issues around financial stability. They were concerned about paying their rent, paying their utilities, taking care of their basic needs. And as expected, someone who's concerned about those things, school is less of a priority at that point. Other students reported that their workload had maybe increased or it was so high that they really just not, could not find the time to prepare and study for their assignments. Other students uh, reported that they had written communication um, issues and research issues. Some of the students kind of had issues with using, um, you know, kind of APA format or just using academic writing in general. And so they, you know, so that was a struggle and they lost a lot of points on their assignment because the way they communicated their ideas did not adhere to the standards, the academic standards. And other students struggled with integrating research into their academic assignments. Mm -hmm. Uh, some other students reported that understanding the instructions for the assignment was something that just, it just, they didn't understand the assignment fully. And so they did not really respond to the requirements of it. And other students reported that they did not have a clear study plan in general for just working through the assignments in the course. And so kind of considering those issues that contributed to the students' performance gaps, uh, again, we wanted to use that data, again, them not passing their key assessment and them reporting these are the issues that impacted their performance, we wanted to start us addressing those issues with students. So one of the things we did is we talked with all instructors in general and instructors who were anticipating working with students during the next term in particular around incur explicitly encouraging the students to reach out to them to kind of uh, talk about their needs and to also utilize resources at the university, such as mental health services and tutoring. Uh, they also um, worked with the students to develop success slash remediation plans to help them develop a plan to address, like for instance, if they have a written communication issue, maybe planning to utilize tutoring. 
we started um, scaffolding the learning material. This is a kind of a course level intervention where we started scaffolding the learning material so students would be able to be exposed to and reinforce the learning material at multiple points in the course. And then we looked at um, having the students review the key assessments on multiple occasions. So the students wouldn't only see the, hear about or learn about the key assessments during maybe the orientation to the course or as they reviewed the syllabus on the first day, these students would also have an opportunity to kind of talk about the assignment and the criteria on the rubric at other points in time. And just as a check-in, does anyone have any questions about or comments about anything I've shared so far? So I'll make one, Tara. I, I, th okay. love, I love the examples that you're giving and it's really inspiring. And hopefully faculty, you're, you, you're doing this, but then also consuming just different mechanisms and ways that you can engage students, engage data, and really engage your program is very intentional. And I think that's what you're clearly demonstrating is that it's a, an approach to facilitate programmatic improvement. And I think that that's excellent. And I think once again, You've shared so many varieties of perspective, student qualitative feedback, student um, performance data, operational effectiveness. So it's not just student success rates. It's not just persistence. It's actually trying to learn about the whole student experience. And I think that's a key element that when you think about your program, you don't just think about the classes you teach, the sequence and the order that you teach them. But what's that whole experience look like and how are you affecting that? And I think, you know, it, it was awesome for you just to barely touch on that. And please go if anyone else has questions and then continue. OK, and just so you know, when I have the screen up, I can't really see if someone is in the chat asking me something. So if someone has a question, definitely just jump in there. I, it doesn't you could just jump right on in there and interrupt me. OK, so I think Enrique has a question. Go ahead. OK, yes. Quick, uh, so thank you, Tara. Quick question. How does the uh, program? review process contributes to quality improvement? Yeah. So in this, yeah, so I, that's a great question. So in this case, in kind of specifically looking at, you know, how students are performing on these key performance indicators, we, you know, we have used it to look at how our courses are structured and how um, the learning materials we're using um, in those courses and even um, the instructor's approach to interacting with the students. And because again, there's a relational element to being an instructor and, and if the student is having some issues that are impairing their ability to perform, being able to kind of engage their instructor and let them know, I'm, I have a health issue, you know, or I have an employment issue, or, you know, I'm unemployed and I need to find a job and I'm really stressed out, we are encouraging and supporting our instructors and in really having those conversations with them and problem solving with the students and coming up with a strategy, you know, to help the students succeed. And it may be something as simple as a student needs a little bit more time to work on an assignment so they don't rush through it and overlook some key components of it. Um, so, you know, just from an instructional practice um, perspective, helping our instructors use kind of what we would consider um, being almost even a trauma-informed um, instructor where they're paying attention to if our clients or if our students have some type of life event or issue, we're counselors and we're trained to be empathic around that. So as instructors, we're integrated that into our teaching practices as well. Any other? Amanda or uh, Tricia, anything? Um, just looking at the uh, the Padlet, looks like there's lots of just conversations and questions. So um, just a reminder, feel free to to go in there and put some answers and questions in there as well. It's a lot of great conversation. And I know Yark, you had a question for Tara. Oh, you know, so we, I yes, I would like to um, uh, latch on to the idea of the of the case study that I saw as part of the title, right, of your of your uh, slide deck here. And, and I tell you, I, I love the idea. I think that um, case study is 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 really from from research perspective, right? And I'm sure that you know both of you can attest to this. 
would require for some type of uh, data triangulation, right? I mean, you have you have interviews, you have you have student voices, you have faculty voices, uh, and then you have the data that can be obtained without even talking to the students, right? There's there's the persistence rates, you know, transition rates, and so forth. So this is all great. I just I just wonder uh, from from your perspective. Um, what what if we try to to start naming things that way uh, to make it more more appealing to to really our our uh, faculty and administrators who these days I I, I tell you we have a, a larger influx of, of of PhDs and EDDs and people with higher degrees than we ever had before I think at least you know as I look at the Colleges that I that I that I um, that I'm familiar with uh, in 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 my uh, professional spheres, and and um, quality improvement the, the 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 process that's that's ongoing really comes from action research. Again, it's a it's a concept that we are we are certainly familiar with. How how would you feel about that? How how can further discussion about actually studying each one of the concepts of of, of program review from the research perspective? How could that help um, disseminate the information, um, engage others, and most importantly, involve student voices? I really uh, appreciate and, and really love that perspective, you know, on just kind of, again, just rethinking how we even um, present this idea, right? Because I think it makes it it, it makes it feel more purposeful. And it also seems to, to me, it's just, it's, it, it's more engaging because it feels like it, it's meaningful. It's, hey, we're on a mission to kind of uncover what we can do to be the best program we can be and to provide the best learning experience for our students as, as opposed to it feeling very kind of like, hey, we're just kind of going through the motions of producing the data because and doing the reports, like doing the, the assessment plans and the, the outcome reports, it would feel like, no, we're, we're on a mission to figure out how to do this more effectively. So I, and, and kind of the case study approach, I think would be pretty appealing to most people. And I think even, I'm glad you brought up the student part too, because I think even them seeing, you know, we do share this information with the students and ask for their feedback as well. Um, but I think we would probably get more engagement from mm. them mm. if mm. we pull them in in that way too, because some of the students are particularly curious about this kind of stuff. And so they tend to show up to those meetings and, and, and engage and ask questions and make suggestions. But for the students, you know, again, and we're a counseling program. So a lot of times kind of the social science programs are not, you know, the students aren't necessarily excited about <laughs> the research courses they take and research in general. They're more about being practitioners and things like that. So I think this would also help engage them too. Wow. As I as I listen to you, the the more I think about it, you know, if you if you were to you're 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 absolutely right. Just just the idea of uh, latching onto a theory, right? Studying what it is that's guiding our efforts as a a uh, collection or body of research or literature that already exists out there versus fulfilling a mandate, right? I mean, those would be like, wow, light, night, night and day to me approaches. So that that would, I, I, I thank you again for, for, for your supportive comments, uh, Tara. Makes, makes a lot of sense to me. So, so thank you very much. Uh, Medicine has a, has a question. You, you, you raise your hand, go ahead. Hi, um, I'm uh, Maddie Tabor. I work at Our Lady of the Lake University in San Antonio, Texas. So I'm joining from the, the Lone Star State here. Uh, lots of fun things happening in Texas right now with education. But uh, I just want to make sure I'm following along. So like, I love this idea of treating program review as a case study, almost as like a form of faculty engagement. So Sometimes when I when I experience faculty resistance, I'm a I'm a, a director of assessment and accreditation, so I like am the liaison with a lot of faculty. I hear like this isn't research, right? Like uh, looking at you know the percentage of students that met or didn't meet an outcome, it's not statistically you know uh, valuable. It's not this. It's not that. And sort of having to respond and explain how assessment is different, but with program review. It's that triangulation piece, I think, would really empower those faculty 
to say like, well, here's some research you can do, right? Every five years, you know, here's like this framework for you to do a focus group and a survey with students and a, you know, some, some kind of engagement with alumni and yeah, like do it in that way where you're collecting data from multiple sources. And of course, looking at the quantitative stuff, right? Matriculation, retention, persistence, graduation. Um, I am having multiple light bulb moments, but for, for me, what I'm taking away so far is like, wow, what a great response I now have, uh, you know, in terms of like, hey, let's, let's make this like meet your definition of research a little bit more. And yeah, even calling it a case study, like I think could be very powerful for my faculty. So I appreciate this conversation. And I, and I think even to build upon that logic is um, also looking at timeframes. I think that's a, something that maybe if we could put in the Padlet, when do you do program review? That's a fantastic question. Some people do it every five years. Someone do it like every six. So they're in alignment with title five, like every two for career education. So at our institution, we used to have comprehensive reviews. And so everybody had to like pull their hair out to get them all done at once. And we're like, why are we stressing people out? There's no rules for a comprehensive review. The rules are get your curriculum reviewed and make sure that you're in alignment with, with the standards based on your accreditation. But there's no comprehensives ever do. And so we had all this really, really fun comprehensive process. But through collaboration, we said, you know, in this day and age, we understand strategic planning can't be five years, 10 years, 20 years. I've seen plans that long. And you just like, you can't, you can't look at that um, as, as something meaningful. Because as far as your planning scope uh, broadens, as far as the length goes out. And so at our institution, we moved it to, to program review done every year. But it's also to that approach where, what's that focus? What's that area? And leveraging something like a case study or like different things where you can build upon the work you're doing. I think some of the fears when you're doing a comprehensive is you have to do everything in the universe, make 4,000 plans, try to save everything under the sun. You just can't do that. That's not feasible. That's not logical. That's not fair. So how do we do that in a way that's impactful, meaningful? And we, and we took it bite size at a time to say, let's focus on a few things. Encourage faculty, if you are going to make a plan or initiative, maybe one or two, and then measure your progress on that. On top of that progress and learning from the students, learning from your peers and externally, internally, how, what else do we want to do? And head down that direction. I, I feel that the idea of let's make a goal five years from now worked in 1990, but we're not there anymore. I think things are constantly changing so quickly. I mean, just look at your iPhone, like one, like how many of us would have had that? Like, well, like 10, like 10 years ago, 15 years ago, like planning really long-term is very hard because look at today's day and age and think about that with the curricular changes, the really the big emphasis that all of our colleges have been doing with uh, DEIA um, initiatives, embedding that into the work we're doing. Five years ago, that may not have been the same for everybody's institution. So I think given the autonomy to allow faculty to say, you know, similar to what Tara is doing is saying, let's focus on these areas, but make it consumable and, and uh, something that could be done. And Tara, I want you just to maybe to add some of your thoughts on that. I agree with you 100%, just making it doable. Because I think it's discouraging to kind of take on this big project and not be able to adequately carry it through. That's discouraging. People would then just maybe feel like, well, why am I doing this? And is it meaningful? And also, if they're able to kind of take on something that huge and do it, you might just burn people out. <laughs> and that's not good either, because if people are burned out, then their perspective on it might be negatively biased. And, and, and they may just feel like, you know what, I don't ever want to do it anymore. And really, it's most incredible and effective when you have everyone is on board. Everyone may not be involved at the same level, but everyone gets it. There's buy-in and they're willing and able to do their part. And for some, doing their part may be simply use the rubrics. <laughs> Like sometimes it's that simple. Um, just, you know, because sometimes for some people using the rubrics can be a little tricky and it, and it may be outside of their comfort zone, um, especially technology wise. And, and, and just for them to just invest in the process of, okay, I can do my part, 
by figuring out how to use the rubrics within the learning management system so we can properly and accurately collect data. That's huge. That's huge. And I think you touched on something. I know we we're going to talk about this later, but it was just a perfect segue. So many of us teach, many of us teach very well. And so as we teach our students, what do we do with our assignments? We don't just be like, write this paper. Maybe you do that and maybe that's acceptable. But the reality is, is you have a grading rubric typically. You have some instructions and guidance. And so how does that reflect in your program review? Again, a lot of times what I've seen at my institution and others is you give someone a template, be like, fill this out. Then they fill it out wrong. And then there's like, why'd you do it wrong? And they're just like, well, where's the training? Where's the rubric? And so some of the things that we've, we've developed was something like if anyone uses Canvas, you know how you have like speed grader where you can just go through and it gives the details on like below standard, standard, above standard type of a thing. Thinking about that or student learning outcomes type of a thing, think about how that scale is of learning. How are you teaching your faculty how to can, you know, write these reports, do these analyses? Not everyone's like born has an innate ability to be like, I love writing program review. I'd love to do that every day, right? No one, no one's goes to college for program review writing. Maybe like one person, like technical writing and stuff. But the reality of the fact is like, how are we engaging individuals? And, and Tara is a great example. And I have some individuals I work with as well at my institution who is Im embedded in that and really a partner with faculty and collaborating. And I think you brought up a good point is, you know, how are we setting those standards to, help, to guide individuals so they know that they're putting the assignment together? And that's where we've kind of made program review kind of like an assignment, kind of like how, how, you, how Tara is like a case study, something that's more impactful and meaningful, not a, just a process to check a box. I don't know, Tara, do you want to share some thoughts on that? I definitely, you know, I have experienced and felt the check the box kind of moment. <laughs> and so, and I've seen, you know, and I've been with colleagues who kind of feel that way sometimes. And, and I do believe that it is so important, like the, like the rubric is just for the key assessments in particular, like that is, that is the biggest thing we need is just consistently measuring across, and we have multiple campuses and, and because we have multiple campuses, we want, and we have adjuncts and full-time faculty teaching, it's really tempting for people to go, well, I kind of want to do it this way. <laughs> and I just want to modify it and that's not. So really just even getting to a point where all the faculty kind of come together and can agree that this rubric can serve our needs, right? This, this measures what we believe it needs to measure and we all agree to at least use this rubric for these particular assignments and not only use it into the data, into the learning management system. Because again, those are two different steps. And I do believe, um, again, the conversations with the faculty, the buy-in, um, the commitment is a key and important part of that. And, and I've seen it and we've seen improvements in that working and we consistent now consistently we have our full time faculty using those rubrics. Uh, our adjuncts are still kind of navigating that process because they're newer and so and a lot of it is just kind of a consistent, you know, following up with training, training and follow up and to confirm their understanding. And fortunately, most of them are so um, cooperative and they want to do the right thing that, you know, if we notice that they didn't put their data into the rubric we can go back to them and just say, hey, we noticed that you graded the assignment and you did all this narrative piece <laughs> and you used the rubric, but you didn't enter the data into the system. And without having the actual data, we have gaps in the, in the information we have. And so they're willing to cooperate in that way too. But I do feel like that the training and the conversations and the engagement is a key part of that. And, and that brings up a good point about how do you be inclusive with program review? How do you gather, say, for example, your campus similar to mine has multiple locations, lots of part-time people, people working at a distance. Not everyone's going to want to come in and hang out in a room, go on Zoom and be like, want to write program review? Not really, right? How do we get to that point where you can gather their perspective, but you're not making them author. An approach that, that I've seen used and, and we've adopted as well is we've sent out surveys to faculty that are really focused on areas of their interest. You know, tell us about your classroom experience. Tell us, uh, like, 
what do you really like to do? You know, tell us about the professional development you've done. Tell us about the professional development you'd like to do. And we send that to primarily not really to some full-time faculty because they're very highly involved in the process, but primarily to part-time faculty who can give a diverse perspective on that and to say, here's what I've used in my specialized class. Here are some things that I see emerging. And many of our part-time faculty work in multiple institutions. And so they can see some promising practices that occur across institutions and can share that. And then it gives the opportunity to gather their voice and to include them as well in the process. And I think that's one of the key aspects is program review is really about inclusion telling your story, understanding the message, and really improving students' experience in learning and, and you know, long-term. And so I think, like I said, it, every college has their own way of doing it. I wish I could tell you there's a perfect report on how you can do it, but I think we, we've all approached it through many different lenses. And I think that's the, the beauty of program review is, is it's who um, we are as an institution, how we define ourselves and our programs. And I think to me, a lot of the times someone gets a rubric or a, a template and be like, we're keeping this template forever, right? Like we've always had this template. What do you mean we can't change it? I think my school changes my template almost every year. And it's not because we're just like, oh, this, that, and the other. We have reflection points in our program department review committee to say what's working What's not working? What questions aren't being answered? And as emerging things come up, how can we incorporate that in, understanding that's a focal document to how programs plan, operate, tell their stories? So we went, here's a story. We went from a legit to one, I think it was like a one-page report that was program review. And we gave them like a 10-page template. These 10-page templates turn into 50-page, mostly narrative written reports every year. Not because we asked them to write all this narrative, it's because people want to tell their story. People want to be heard. And then creating venues for them to share that story, I think, is very empowering because their stories are very inspirational. Like we have this biology group working with the art group to print 3D arms to, to give out to the children's hospital. Like very inspiring stories. If you're not working in those departments, how do you know? You don't. Just because we're so big, we're so dispersed. And how do you make that meaningful? And so those are some just various aspects of, of that. I don't know, Terry, what are your thoughts on stuff? I, I definitely feel like I've, you know, seen how, again, the reports have shifted in the content that's in them based on how empowered faculty feel. Because sometimes if it's, you know, if it feels like it's so limited and so like, hey, we want this data point, we want this data point, it, you know, people just kind of feel like, again, they're just kind of filling out the form. But I do feel like when um, there, and we've seen kind of at the administrative level, there's been, give, they've been giving us a lot more space to kind of really get into the narrative component. And also we started attaching <laughs> additional reports, things they didn't ask for. We're like, we know you didn't ask for it, but here it is anyway. Um, and so we, we started kind of building on the report in a similar way, it sounds like, what you experienced at your institution. Yeah. So I don't know if it, Aaron, you let me know what you think. I can continue to go through. I think it'd be I think it'd be great to continue to, to share some of the findings that you've had. And like I said, we can open up, we can pause for conversation. I think that'd be great. Okay. So I'll go ahead and share. And again, if people have comments, just jump in there because I can't really see any hands or anything like that. There are some questions whenever this is works in into the presentation about collaboration and finding space and place and time for collaboration. All right, so Aaron, do you feel like, I think, do you feel like we can address that later or do you want to address that? I think while the, the questions are pertinent, we can address those now, would that be good? If you wanted okay. to start. And then there, there's also, I, I'm, I'm getting a few messages myself as well, just direct messages. So. Okay, um, okay. Uh, so, so I can kind of talk a little bit about collaboration and then pass it on to you. So um, with, a coll with collaboration for us, um, kind of some of our key stakeholder groups, you know, again, have been external partners as well as internal. So we do have an advisory board and that consists of various uh, community members and practitioners who are in the field 
they're practicing and they talk to us and speak to us about the relevance of our curriculum and our training process. And they contribute their thoughts and ideas about how our students are performing, um, how we've structured our um, key assessments, as well as other tools for collecting data. And, um, and again, they provide us with feedback on that and ideas for enhancing and improving the program. So, so that advisory board is one facet. And then we have our site supervisors and they provide us with critical information about, again, what we're doing in our program, as well as how our students are doing, because they're another set of eyes on our training process. And finally, kind of, we have that internal group of people, and that is various departments within the institution who are using that data to support our program. And that includes just even our, um, the people who help us with building our courses. And, and using the technology to help our students navigate the content that's in them, they're able to also support us in building and constructing courses that are more easy, and easy more easily navigated and students again can access and really feel like they can really um, access and easily find the learning materials. Excellent. One of the questions that, that came up in, in the chat, which I really like this question, is you write this report, you pour your heart into it, you tell your entire story, you do this case study, and then what, right? Like, look, we put it on a website, cool story, that's great. Um, one of the things that the question that came up in here was, I'm scrolling up to that question, um, how do we follow up to those reports? I think it's a phenomenal question. So. And I'll just speak from my experience uh, at multiple institutions, but primarily um, my current institution. So we go through a validation process, a peer validation and review process. And remember, we conduct program review every year. And so through the peer review process, we have faculty review other faculty, typically a team of three, reviewing it not in a lens of, of an auditor or, or a negative perspective, but through um, appreciative inquiry through inquiry where we can ask questions for better understanding, provide recommendations or suggestions, but they're not really recommendations. And so with our newer process is maybe even looking at what we call core inquiries. So what they're doing with accreditation is asking core inquiries to tell us a little bit more about this or share this perspective. Then we have multiple opportunities at our institution. We have wing planning councils that plan um, like student services instruction like where Every program gets the opportunity throughout the fall and spring term to share. Imagine like a very, very short, like three minute snapshot of your program. You get to tell all your friends about all the cool stuff you're doing in the direction you want to go. We've been doing that for years and people were able to then hear about that and understand when you're like, hey, we want Lamborghinis. You can understand why you want them. And so. We also close out the end of our fall term and spring terms with something called the Planning Summit, which is a college-wide event. We do it in person with food and parties, but we've been doing it over Zoom for the last couple of years where you'll get 200 people from our college come out and we give some big snapshots of what's happening in program review at the programs. And we have a variety of speakers. It's usually 19 speakers in one hour, so very quick. But people at the college get to really find out what happens. The follow-up, though, with the validation process, as I first alluded to, was that a team of three, three faculty will look at that, provide core inquiries or feedback to that. And then the individuals can address those inquiries in their following review. And program review is like a living document. So when you have plans, goals, and initiatives, follow up on that. What's the next steps? What's your progress? You don't want to create a goal, but yeah, we're going to do this according to what, according to who. And I think those are the things is really how do you, again, make it meaningful? If someone's going to make a plan, well, it needs to be purposeful. And we want to see it too completion. And we want to hear about that. It's not just, hey, we hired a full-time faculty. That's great. What'd they do? Where are you at two years from now? And having that reflection point, having that story to tell. And I think that's the key aspect of really program review is, is going through and telling the story from the ideation phase all the way through the outcomes phase and, and using that venue that goes across multiple years or multiple cycles to tell that story. And I think to me, that's a key aspect of how we use follow-up and then sharing that information college-wide. We have a call, something called the closing of the loop report. We send that out college-wide. It's from every program review about their initiatives, what they've done and what the outcomes have been. That's a 45-page report everyone gets every year because we have a lot of things people want to do. 
And I think those are the things that really help speak volumes to really see the impact of what we're trying to do and make in our students' lives. And so I think that those are the opportunities for, for follow-up. Erin, can you say that again? What was the closing of the loop? So the closing the loop report is a report that that actually gathers all the initiatives and plans out of program review. And as we look at program department review, we look at what's your initiative, you know, what's the progress, and what's your outcome been. And so what we do with that report is we then share that out college wide by every program. And it's like 40, like I said, it's about 45 pages long. But every time accreditation comes, it's like, how do you know? How are you checking progress? We're like, well, how are we checking progress? You know, and we're really, that's how the concept we came up with about four or five years ago to share, to share that story. Because a lot of times I feel that we have a lot of ideas and then the ideas turn into nothing. And so how do we continue that ideation and evolution of, of the directions we want to go? And I think that for our public, for our constituents, for our stakeholders, sharing that with those individuals has been very impactful. You know, because you always walk into to your college and be like, what are we doing? Right. And you think about that. And then someone's like, here's all we're doing. It's like, whoa. And so in my area, we oversee grants. And and so with that, we've leveraged a lot of these initiatives and program department review to, to facilitate into grants into the work we're doing. So it's taking the need identified by the faculty and saying, how do we bring that need to life? So it doesn't have to be all general funded, you know? And I think that's the beauty of things is how do we help help and empower others to make things come together? Um, and so I saw, and, and they're all posted, I'll post a link to the closing loop report in just a bit in the chat. Um, but I think to me, those are some, some key areas. And I don't know, um, Amanda or our coaches could maybe add something to the Padlet about training. I'd like to hear about what other colleges are doing for training. Because like I said, we just wrote a guidebook that guides people through the template. Like we're looking at videos, one-on-one -on -one meetings. We're looking at a variety of different factors and how do we meet people where they are? We talk about doing it with our students, but how do we do that with our faculty? And is it faculty to faculty? And Tara, I want to hear your thoughts on that to say, what have you been doing? So with as far as like, again, sharing out and specifically sharing out the story, we've definitely um, found it, that it is an important part to kind of make sure we circle back to folks, that we circle back to the students. We go to, they have a, a student association meeting and we go to that meeting to make sure we share out the findings and the results and get their feedback. Uh, we also uh, make sure that we share out again with um, not only administrative and uh, various departments within the institution, but also again, the external stakeholders, which for us is primarily those sites. And, and that's because again, they have some really valuable information to share as practitioners in the field that can really just help us gain even more clarity from the data that we're pulling and they could just add all of these additional insights. And so uh, for the, we do a five year report, which is pretty much the most uh, comprehensive review of the program. And then we do annual reports and we don't, and in those reports, we take certain segments of data and we look at them, but the, but the five year review is the most comprehensive. Oops, I was on mute. I because I'm going to pull up the Padlet and see what others are doing for training, or if anybody else wants to share their thoughts, any of our coaches, any of the members, what they're doing for training for program review. So I read in the chats face-to-face uh, -face training, and so, and I don't know if if Tiffany, you want to expand upon that. Is it like a broad range of training, or like one-on-one -on -one training, discipline training? What is that? I was just reading from the chat. I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, can you hear me? Yeah, you're good. Okay. Yeah. So our face-to-face -face training is primarily a five-hour training where we cover everything going through the template, how program review is situated within the college planning process. Um, we do offer lunch. Um, now, if folks can't do that full-day training, where they have an opportunity to dive deep and actually begin the writing and reflection process. Um, then we do, uh, you know, one-on-one -on -one trainings. Um, 
Uh, I'll also do them over Zoom. So folks come to my office, um, I do Zoom, do multiple programs on Zoom. The main one we do is at the beginning of every semester with a large group of faculty writers. Excellent, excellent. That's good, five hours. Wow, thank God you have lunch. <laughs> wow, it's intense. Yeah. <laughs> That's cool. So anybody else want to share? I know we, we put it in the in the Padlet. I'm trying to gather the, the link in the Padlet. Go ahead, I, Tricia. I can share just a little bit. Um, we have kind of a, a, I guess I'd say a very layered approach to training and even to feedback so that year after year, the program plans, the, the program reviews continue to, uh, I guess, get better and better, right? Um, that's our goal, um, that our feedback and our work would become more and more meaningful in very intentional ways. And so uh, we provide, uh, we have a department plan program review uh, committee. It's a subcommittee of our committee on curriculum and instruction. And so uh, at the beginning of the academic year and at the beginning of the program review process, we hold some, we convert our department meetings into sort of workshops, um, or not a workshop, but more of an information session where more training is provided. Um, and then we also convert some of those meetings into workshops during the process where folks can come in uh, collectively with their colleagues, their faculty who are working together with them. And uh, right now we're still meeting on Zoom because it seems to be um, more efficient and more effective. And we break out into breakout rooms and there are various folks, our curriculum chair, myself, the SLO coordinator, our director of planning, um, a number of other folks are there in the room circulating, our Dean of Academic Affairs, right, circulating to help uh, folks answer questions and so on and so forth. But we also provide um, some larger workshops that are open to colleagues across the campus, not just those who are participating or heading up the program planning or program review. Um, and we, each of our, each of our programs is assigned a researcher liaison to help to guide them through the data and the, that reflection piece. So there's kind of a layered approach uh, from that front. Um, but then uh, another thing that's really has been really great uh, in the recent years is that we've been begun to provide de departments and disciplines individualized feedback related to their plans and their reviews. And so we offer actually a training for anybody who would like to become a reviewer um, and then some guide, at, some guidelines as far as how to review the, these um, plans and, and program reviews in a way that is supportive and encouraging and um, ask them in certain cases to dig deeper uh, into the data, but really also compliments uh, them and commends them for the really great work that they're doing. And so we have a, a cohort of faculty um, and a couple of administrators uh, as far as our Dean of Academic Affairs and our Director of Planning that really uh, help to support these efforts. So there's sort of the continuous training, the workshops with support, and then the, the feedback that goes out uh, in, a, in a way to kind of keep that cycle, close that loop and keep that cycle of feedback and support um, going in a very consistent way. Go ahead, Enrique. Uh, Tricia, with that being said, or maybe for Aaron, do you guys utilize data coaches? Glad you, I'm glad you asked that question. So when data coaching came out, I don't know, like five, six years ago, I remember we had a lot of one-on-one -on -one trainings and then the pandemic hit and where it's like, what are we going to do? And so we created a full-on Canvas one for data coaching. And so the Chancellor's Office reached out to me and a few colleagues to make some self-paced ones. And so those are available for any college and, and via Canvas Commons. I think we, like the one that I put out has like 160 downloads. Three is three weeks long. It could be faculty led or individual led. But in those data coaching, at least at Coastline, and by the way, Coastline's small, 
very small college. We've already had 96 people already complete that type of practice. And so now we're embedding that into our equity trainings now uh, for our equity cohort trainings for our faculty. And so building a data coaching component in there with the, the added equity lens into really doing that. Because I think you bring up a great point, Enrique, is, you know, we can give people tons and tons and tons of data, right? But it's like, what am I going to do with this? You can give them tons of dashboards, but it's just like, what is this? What is this visual showing me? Right. And I think empowering individuals with these trainings is very helpful. And it goes back to something that, that Tara and Yark myself are talking about is, you know, when someone needs to make a decision, you don't hand them an ocean. Like, for example, I need a drink of water. If you look at the picture behind me, you don't give me an ocean. You give me a drink of water. And so doing that with data is you don't give somebody a tidal wave when they just want to drink. And so thinking about that, the meaningfulness, impactfulness, how to help individuals ask the right question for the right data. So for example, I need success rates for when, for who, for what, what do you mean by success, right? Help them examine that question to say, I need annual success rates by my discipline, but broken down by demographics for course completion rates of achieving a C or higher. And so then that helps when working with your partners and in institutional effectiveness or whatever to clearly articulate what you're looking at. And I think that's some of the key aspects, not just analyzing the data, but learning how to, to just like chat GPT, learning how to ask the right question. I think that's the, the magic. So. So I think that's some of the stuff. I don't know if anybody else wants to share about their data coaching experiences. But we can, I can just share briefly about our college. It's been, it's been really beneficial. We have a, a lead who helps train the data coaches go through a course and they meet weekly. Um, and usually they're um, involved in the program somehow, whether they're in the same pathway or, or whatnot. But having that, level of familiarity to really meet with the program and see what specific data they need. We've gone away from the model as was articulated by many others of just throw all the data possible in your program review and then just hope something sticks and that the program review committee won't notice what you're doing. You know, kind of just, let's just hope something applies. But really what is the data that is what your program wants to do, how it wants to go, what it's reflected. And the data coaches are there to help guide them in that process of thinking, um, especially when we're looking at our DI populations, to look at the DI populations for their particular program and how they might help to close those gaps in their assessment outcomes or student success. All right, excellent. Uh, Tara, do you have more slides to share? There's been, people are asking in chat left and right, what's happening to Tara? <laughs> okay, I'll pull up the slides. <laughs> Thank you. I just want to make sure that we have enough time. It's, it's uh, you know, we, we, we have this conversation scheduled for two hours, but as you can see, you know, we are so engaged, it's, it's kind of like, you know, time gets away. So, so please. Absolutely. So we talked a bit about the key assessments and how we use, again, that data, the quantitative and qualitative data. Uh, the other area we looked at um, included instructor and course evaluations. And in this case, what we have already in place is uh, an it's electronic. Uh, it's the course and instructor evaluation that's administered to the students at the conclusion of every course. And we you know, realized, hey, this is an opportunity for us to integrate some of these diversity, equity, and inclusion questions into it so we can learn more about how our, our students experience the classes. And so uh, we were able to, again, thinking of not also overwhelming the students by asking them an excessive amount of questions, we narrowed it down to three questions that we felt like we could integrate into the survey and not, um, again, overwhelm them with a lot of questions in general and about DEI in particular. And some of the questions included, um, did my instructor encourage me to reflect on how my own cultural identities and biases could potentially influence the way I apl apply the course content in, in the way I work in the field? Um, another question was around, did my instructor introduce students to culturally specific or culturally informed theories and approaches to the subject matter? And uh, did my instructor provide students with learning materials that included expertise, uh, the, the expertise of diverse 
counselors. And so those were questions we felt like were really um, important to ask our students. And in cases where, um, again, the goal in this case was uh, on a scale of one to five is for our students to evaluate or give our instructors feedback on those items. And the goal was for the instructors to earn at least a four out of five on those items. And in cases where instructors did not earn a four out of five, we followed up um, to kind of find out um, ways that we could improve and enhance those items because this feedback is, um, you know, again, critical to helping our, our instructors learn and grow. And so some of those um, course improvement plans included um, assisting our instructors directly with um, finding and identifying some of those culturally specific theories and materials that they can integrate into the courses uh, with the counseling program being um, again, a clinical program where students are learning to provide mental health services to clients, they often watch um, demonstration videos of experts delivering the services. And what we found is that in a lot of cases, it was um, easy to kind of find videos of diverse clients being served, but not diverse experts delivering the services and providing um, that expertise to the students. And so we assisted instructors with helping them also kind of find some of those materials. And we encouraged our instructors to add reflections and classroom discussions on ways um, that so students can reflect on how cultural bias could impact their work with diverse clients. Again, this is that piece where we're cultivating that communication and dialogue and self-exploration and then finally, uh, we encouraged our instructors to utilize mediators and safe space allies to address the challenges that might emerge in the classroom environment. So what we found is that some of our instructors were a little anxious about maybe integrating or initiating some of those conversations out of concern that maybe some type of conflict would emerge. And, and so having these resources at the university empower the instructors to feel like, hey, if the conversations or the activities kind of felt like they, were, they weren't able to kind of really manage them effectively, that there is a route for them to take to kind of do that reparative work with the students and do um, what they can to create that safe space for them. Um, as I kind of mentioned earlier, our um, internship site supervisors, again, are a critical part of the learning um, environment for our students, these internship sites. And so as with the instructors who are in the classroom with our students, these internship site supervisors are also um, given feedback and evaluated by our students. And they also were evaluated um, through um, a survey tool that was administered to our students. And they were, it was on a scale of one to five with the expectation that the site supervisors earn at least a four out of five on the DEI items. And those questions, again, were, um, again, uh, designed to help our, you know, for our students to give our site supervisors feedback on, hey, do I feel like they're helping me develop my cultural competence? And do I feel like they were able to respond to me in a culturally competent way? And so some of those questions included, did my site supervisor encourage me to reflect on my own cultural identity and potential biases on how on my work with clients? Did I have opportunities to work with diverse clients whose backgrounds were different from my own? Did my site supervisor help me use advocacy competencies to address the institutional and systematic issues impacting culturally diverse clients? And did my site supervisor respond to my ideas and feedback about how culture influences our supervisory relationship and my experiences at the internship site? So again, trying to understand what they are experiencing and how they are growing professionally. And some of the interventions we use to kind of address some of the site supervisors who receive less than a four out of five on those particular tools, on those particular items, is um, we started discussing diversity, equity, and inclusion in the site supervisor orientation. Every year before they work with our students, we orient them to the program, we orient them to the paperwork and the expectations of their role. And so we intentionally made sure that we spoke to the, um, our expectation that they are able to kind of be culturally informed and competent in the way they interact with the students 
and that they prepare our students to be culturally competent. And, and that again, help you know, them understand that expectation and it prepared them for when we went out to their sites to talk to them about how they, they were doing, you know, their plans for working with our students, it created an opportunity for us to also discuss with them on a one-on-one -on -one basis. Is there any resource or anything we can do to support them as site supervisors to enhance their performance and their work in those areas? And, and again, that, that conversation started in orientation and it continued in these one-on-one -on -one site visits. And then we started annually delivering and recording uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion focused webinars for the site supervisors. And we invited them to university level um, trainings and events that um, maybe ordinarily, you know, they wouldn't get or they might overlook because they come through and they, they may, you know, feel like, oh, this isn't relevant to me. We started explicitly kind of inviting them and saying, look, we know you're, you're in the counseling program and serving counseling students, but this particular workshop on LGBTQ plus um, um, students may, is something that we think will be useful in helping inform your practice and your work. And so we were, you know, kind of intentionally inviting them to specific events. We looked at persistence and graduation rates, uh, again, with a goal of 80% of the students um, persisting through and graduating from the program on time. It's a three-year program. And as I discussed before, these students are on a cohort model. So they start the program and they go over and they go through every course with the same cohort of students and they graduate together. And persistence automatically impacts graduation because if they slip out of a course, you know, whether they withdraw or they don't earn a passing grade in it, they're then put in a, another cohort that graduates later. And what we found is when students didn't persist or graduate on time, some of the issues that came up for them were work schedule and workload, you know, being overwhelmed by those items and those being a priority for them. Some of them had transportation issues because we are a face-to-face -face program, so they have to physically come on campus to go to class. And so maybe they had transportation issues or they actually relocated and, and the campus was no longer convenient or viable for them. They also reported needing to prioritize family responsibilities and having family, I mean, having physical and mental health issues. Uh, some of the interventions we started to integrate based on learning this information about the students um, is again, we encouraged our students to reach out to instructors if they were experiencing any of those issues or different issues. Again, fostering and cultivating a relationship with the students. And I spoke earlier a bit about this trauma-informed approach to teaching and instruction, because again, it, it also plays a role in how students do overall in the program. Because before we were looking at performance on specific assessments, this is looking at, again, their persistence in the program and graduation. Um, and then also developing plans, study plans and support plans to help them, again, um, achieve their academic goals. And then finally, this is the last component of what we um, examined and, and, and you know, measured in our program is we looked at diverse instructors. And because our program at our university, 50% of our student body um, identifies as being uh, black indigenous or a person of color. And also we know that diversity is an integral part of our society. And we felt like it's really important for our students to have a learning environment that again, reflects that and cultivates that and helps them work effectively and build relationships across you know, cultures. And what we found is that we looked at our campus composition of faculty and we had a, a campus that didn't have any diverse faculty on it. And that meant that our students could potentially graduate from the program and never have an experience of having a diverse instructor. And what we did with that is we, we decided to make sure that um, as an intervention, one of the things we did is we were very intentional in making sure that we recruited and, and encouraged adjuncts to teach on that campus that you know were diverse in order to give that to increase the likelihood that that's, those students would have more of those experiences with diverse faculty. We also uh, made sure that we started inviting diverse professionals as guest speakers and lecturers to some of the classes again to kind of infuse them with that multicultural piece. And we also encourage students 
um, to engage in program level and university level events where they can meet diverse faculty on other campuses. So maybe their campus didn't have any diverse faculty, but if they're participating in some of these other events, they could form relationships with and meet diverse faculty in other places. And then we also looked at the retention of our diverse instructors, uh, full-time and adjuncts. And we developed um, a mentorship program that enabled us to specifically address some of the concerns that those individuals would have that might impact their um, retention in, uh, at the university. So I'll open things up now. I'm all done with those slides. I'll open things up for questions, comments, reflections. So uh, if, if, I, if I may start us off for this part of the uh, presentation again, thank you, Tara, very, very insightful. I, I, I tell you just, just, just a lot of comments, very, very positive comments about, what, about your work. Uh, from from our perspective as as, as student learning outcomes coordinators, uh, how do you see student assessment of student learning? How, how is that informing program review? What 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 do you do with this? In what's 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 going on from 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 that perspective? Okay, so that's a great question. So from this perspective, one of the things we had to acknowledge is that there were performance gaps and discrepancies once we started disaggregating the data. And that was something that was really getting obscured and lost in the aggregate data, where we could kind of say, oh yeah, we're hitting our targets. 80% of our students are performing and getting at least B grades on these key assessments. And then when we disaggregated that data, we found otherwise. Um, and so that made us as a program have to intentionally look at and examine what is going on and what is impacting these students. And also, in addi and additionally, we wanted to make sure that the learning environment in general is something that, that fosters a sense of belonging and, and connection um, and inclusion among the students. And, and that, again, that's a part of fostering. We talked earlier about just fostering the trust and, and coaching and encouraging the teachers to develop their teaching skills. Part of that includes being able to kind of help the students have access to a variety of faculty and learn from a variety of faculty. And so really just taking all of this data and looking at, hey, how can we improve? How can we strengthen the program and the students experience? And with the expectation and hope that that's going to also improve and enhance their performance as well and retention and, and persistence and all of that. Tara, with, that, with the follow-up question with uh, Yadix, uh, do you have a specific uh, questions being asked regarding in your, I'm sorry, in your program review uh, regarding student learning? Like specific questions that are, you know, that have to do the, the write-up as they yeah. do their program review? Mm. So we, so specific questions are, you know, and based on our accreditation, it's really around specific content areas, like specifically like ethics. Are our students really understanding and able to comprehend their ethical responsibilities as counselors? Uh, we're being asked about, um, we have to answer questions around, do our students understand and can utilize and apply counseling skills? Again, this is kind of a hands-on interpersonal program where they have to be able to establish rapport and connection with clients, as well as guide their clients through a process of um, healing, and improving problematic behaviors or thoughts and feelings. And so can our clients do that? And so our assessments also are asking those questions. Do are our students able to implement, do they understand and, and know what these skills are? And are they able to actually implement those specific skills when they're in the field? Thank you. And the reason I asked that question is uh, because we often use you know, student achievement data or student I want to call it student success data as a measurement of learning. And as we know that in you know, a student uh, achievement data does not ensure that, you know, or guarantees that learning took place, right? Um, transfer rates, this, this completion rates, uh, you name it, right? It doesn't ensure that learning took place. That's why I asked that question. Absolutely. So one of the things that we've incorporated for that um, to really understand the, not just the learning aspect, but what next steps are. So 
we every college has their own SLO tool and their own different things. And we've made our own local one. And in that, not everybody can join the conversation. We, we went back to that conversation of no, not everybody can be at the table at the same time. But how do you capture that perspective? At the end of our SLO reporting, our SLO uh, cloud reporting, what we put in there is asking questions for improvement and how we can improve the learning experience. We extract all that data by course, by SLO, and automatically drop it into program review. So they don't have to go search for it. They don't have to do that. And it's just ideas for inspiration. And I think the questions that, that at least talking to our faculty with standardized rubrics for, for measuring learning, but then also having reflection points uh, for students to say, how have you incorporated this? I know, Terry, you talked about that in certain areas where having them reflect on their learning and really talking about what are like the top areas that, that you feel confident and able to do upon the completion of course, module, whatever you're covering, and then incorporating that feedback and learning from that. Because I think that's some of the key areas where you can see thematic things. And I think everybody, and that's how we at least try to paint SLOs at my, my school is everybody records SLOs all the time indirectly or directly you see people or, or students aren't learning in your class you have to adjust like so for example when I teach a really advanced data modeling if students start picking that up and I'm learning from their experience based on their their feedback not just like did were they able to demonstrate it but based on their feedback based on their experience I'm adjusting every week my class adjusts every week because of who the students are and how to incorporate that and make it better. You can't just like copy paste and keep going, you know? And I think that that approach is really a key aspect of, of that. And I think, you know, Terry, you did a really good job when surveying the students to gather that information to say like, how are you looking at it? And then being very focused, like with your questions were about ethics and things like that. Um, you can do that programmatic level, understanding their able their confidence and ability and perspective to demonstrate and then to show that they do that. It's just how where do you have those conversations and where do you get gather that feedback from your your peers to say, how can we improve this learning? And I think, and then also, once again, we can get deep in the theory that everybody learns a different way, the nine intelligence of learning, the four different ways, because you may feel like, yeah, I just read this 500 page book. Not at all. I watched this two minute like TikTok. Like that's how I did it. Right. And so understanding that and how students learn is, is also going to be a key component as we move forward to, to understand when we get back to that po point of diversity, equity, inclusion, you know. How do we create those experiences where people can learn where they are? So just some thoughts. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you very much for to, to, to both of you. The next question that seems to be coming up uh, when we talk about program reviews, general education outcomes. How, how do departments find themselves, because eventually they do, that they are part of the institution, right? That that student success does not only depend on, on successful completion on their own program, but there is other things that are other student learning outcomes, program learning outcomes, the skills, competencies that students acquire elsewhere. How do departments relate to, 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 to this, to this information, to this data? Well, I can say for our program, we've had to integrate what we call the university level outcomes mm. and we integrate and pair them with the kind of the program learning ones that are very specific to our industry. And thankfully there is some congruence there in, the, in a lot of in some of those outcomes. And so we're able to get those, those learning objectives that we're trying to look at. And so we're able to kind of, again, um, kind of minimize having a lot more assessments and kind of get the most out of the assessments we have and that we are using. So I'm glad you brought that up. But yeah, at the university level, there's also an expectation that they are as a whole demonstrating that students are de developing kind of these broader or general um, skills and abilities and base of knowledge. And so that's kind of what, you know, we find ourselves, we, we had to do is just see where there's overlap and try to kind of integrate them together so we can actually measure them at the same time using some instruments that are relevant to our program as opposed to creating something else just for university mm -hmm. learning. And we've done something similar to create a leading question that's really 
um, focus on a programmatic approach, but incorporating the learning of institutional student learning outcomes and those broader range things. And ours are the same as the GESLOs, so they encompass that broad spectrum. And so asking the programs on how are they addressing that? Because like I said, everybody has their own ideas. I, I, our school believes that there's critical thinking in every program. So, okay, tell us what that means, right? Because our, you know, when we talk about information literacy, what does that mean to you and your program and helps them. And like I said, I look at program review, not just as something of what you're doing, but almost an inspiration of what could you be doing? And that's when we write those prompts because I'll give you an example. And I know we're on a cord line, but it's fine. Is that at my college, like, and this is in the departmental side, um, people were meeting, but meeting just randomly, meeting in the hallway, meeting like wherever, right? Meeting over like phone call, email. And then in accreditation, we were reading like, how do you communicate? And I was like, pause, hold on. Let's let's ask a question of how they're engaging with SLOs, how they're engaging with curriculum and planning and collaboration with their peers. So we can learn about that because surprisingly, a lot of programs meet and don't take minutes. That's old school. Like no one does that. So how do we go about that new way of thinking to say we all communicate through different lenses and, and venues and approaches and really give them the autonomy? And when I say that, that it was a, a big point for us in the operational side, it opened a lot of people's eyes to be like, oh, wow, we never meet. <laughs> we need to start meeting. And really help them think like, okay, let's draw out a plan to start meeting and discussing these simple things. So while it was not a punitive approach, it was more of an enlightening approach for them. So they could say, what are we doing? And I think that's the beauty of how you craft your questions to maybe not just have a reflection, like, what are you doing? What are you doing? But what could you do? And I think that's been very helpful. And it's really created a different community for, for our institution on how people meet and then share that way of how they meet or when they meet. Excellent. Uh, Aaron, since you mentioned, uh, thank you very, very much for the insightful answer. If you, since you mentioned uh, institutional outcomes, right, institutional learning outcomes, we all find ourselves in our professional daily lives uh, uh, under the guidance of, of mission, vision statements, you know, these things that are really of concern to the institution. There are certain competencies, there are certain skills, there are certain uh, uh, notions that students gather acquire as a result of, of of going through this particular through our institutions how how do you think departments could or should or how how do they make sure that uh the institutional integrity for lack of a better expression is preserved in the in the program review process so that students faculty as Tara mentioned earlier uh stakeholders they all have an understanding that, you know, hey, guess what? Our uniqueness, our um, mission, vision, the culture of our institution are all embedded in this process. Is this a loaded question or just 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 in, in my head? It seems like it's just I think it's a, I think it's a lob ball question to, to hit out of the park, I think. So I think to me, when you ask somebody, how's your what's the purpose of your program? Where's the direction you're going in alignment with the college goals? Like, what's that, right? So being intentional and pointing out what those goals are, what's that mission statement, and how do they see their program in alignment with that? You know, I think that's a good starting point in a segue to to draw that alignment. I think helping individuals, and when you're looking at data, you know, and so for example, I'll just make a program up. Imagine we're in a program, we're like, oh my gosh, our students are doing so well. They're like 67% success rates, we're amazing, right? But your college is like 90. Gotta have some, a basis of comparison, you know? And, and as our accreditors have, we have institutional set standards or baseline floor that no one can fall under. You're not supposed to. How do they know? So the approaches we've been using is to incorporate that data. So not just to show a trend of information over time, but as you say, to, to conserve the whole college to say, how do we look in comparison to that? So you may have, you may be outperforming in other areas, but then you may have equity gaps in, in um, different student populations, but you wouldn't know if you didn't have a basis for comparison. And I think those are the key aspects of you know, incorporating and, and I will say almost educating. I mean, while, while I have like our mission statement, like tattooed on my arm, not everybody has that. And so I think with that logic, how can we continue to educate them 
in relation to um, keeping that at the forefront, the mission, the direction, the vision of the college. And it also helps you like, you know, shape your program. So if you're like, our institution is all about DEIA, well, maybe some of your programs should be incorporating that. I think, Tara, you gave some great examples of that to say, you know, this is our institutional focus. And if that's not being made central to the individuals doing this report, they may just do something completely opposite, completely different. And I think that's really providing those focal points. I don't know if you want to share on that, your thoughts on that, Tara. Uh, I definitely see there's, for our program, there's a congruence with the overall university's mission. And what we had, and part of what, you know, even our accrediting body was looking at is, hey, this is kind of what we expect within our industry, within our field. And fortunately for us, our institution as a whole also um, has, speaks to DEI and has been, you know, revised over the years to include that and to make it an important part of the work we're doing. So this kind of charge to start to measure it because we say it's important, it became even more relevant because it is a university level kind of expectation and promise, so to speak, of our university. And and again, I think um, what can be really intimidating about that process is what are we potentially going to find when we really start to unpack and ask these questions. Um, but I will say that thankfully, our university, you know, kind of at large supported our work in this area because it was congruent with the direction of the university as a whole. Perfect. Makes makes perfect sense. Uh, to follow up on this, uh, Cynthia has a question about the ILO assessment process. Okay. Uh, sure. I, I was just going to share briefly what our institution does because we do it. Um, we do it outside of program and area review, and it's so interesting now here on YouTube. So I'm thinking like, oh my gosh, maybe I should put it in program review. Um, but we actually do it from two separate perspectives. So we assess from the. I just stuck in the chat a link to what our institutional learning outcomes um, are. Um, and on our, our graduation survey for all students that graduate with either a degree or certificate, we send out a survey that includes these institutional learning outcomes and we ask the students to assess themselves on how much they how much proficiency they have in each of the five areas that are on that link that I just put down. Um, and then once per year, we assess it from the faculty members perspective. Um, and due to survey fatigue, we can't ask them to answer everything. Um, so once per year, we assess one outcome per year. So we'll ask them, you know, think about, you know, a class that you think is representative of the way in which students tend to do on this particular learning outcome for this class that you think is representative, you know, what is that assessment that you use, and what percentage of your students are, you know, highly proficient, proficient, etc. And then put together a report that like blends the two. So students think that they are XYZ on critical thinking, but the faculty members think that they're ABC. Mm. Um, and sort of like kind of triangulate that together. Um, but our challenge is that we have, you know, survey fatigue and faculty members actually responding to the survey, um, which makes me wonder, gosh, maybe I should stick this into program review instead. <laughs> I think that's an interesting approach. We also do post-grad assessment to understand if they're able and confident in their capabilities across ISLOs, but then we do that across a varying level of assessments with our students. I like the idea of asking the faculty. That's really cool. One of the approaches that we're considering doing is, is it's in it's in draft, so it, we're considering doing it. I just got to get them to say yes, is put it on our college application. Ask about their experience and understanding with our ISLOs, and then mapping that through their whole college experience all the way to the end, and to watch that change in perspective. Um, and to really go from when they first like heard about Coastline to then when they finished at Coastline. And then what's that pre-post analysis basically look like? Right on. Well, anybody else? We are almost uh, running out of time. So, hey. I, what, what, I have, what, a, I have a question, Jerry. Go ahead, Enrique. Go, go right ahead, of course. Uh, either for Tara or Aaron, I'm going to ask this question. How does your process work from your program review as reporting? Do you report to, does the program review committee report to a higher, uh, I don't know, strategic planning council mm -hmm. or a college council or, and then, then what happens after that? You can go first here if you'd like and I'll go. Okay, sure. 
So we report to, there is kind of a university level committee that reviews all of the program, um, all of the programs. And so we do, we report there. And on that particular committee, there are representatives from um, just kind of from the provost office all the way through various programs uh, throughout the university. So that's kind of like the university level council we report to. And in preparation of those reports, we collaborate with and work with our dean of our college, as well as the chairs of our program and the faculty and various stakeholders in the kind of the process of getting feedback and input and um, collecting the data and all of that. But then we present that, you know, particularly that five year review to this committee. And then they give us additional feedback um, and, you know, about what we're doing in the work and ask us questions. And we, again, further refine that um, based on that information. I can almost say if mine is, is almost to an exact T of what Tara said, like I swear where our minds are working in sync. That's exactly, we have a larger committee program department review made up of, of for the operational sides of the and service side of the house, um, individual student services, admin services, president's wing, the instructional side of the house fit over 50% faculty, which oversee the instructional side. They are a subcommittee of the academic senate, but all of their work and findings goes to our instructional um, student services, administrative services, president's wing planning council, which feeds up into our planning committee at the college. So that's the structure by which they operate in. Is your planning committee the overall structure and then they, then um, you, the reporting goes to the planning committee and then do they look at your, uh, for example, I don't mean to use JADIC, do you use JADIC's program and they, they review what took place? So basically, yes. So, so what would happen is program reviews all funnel in. They go through a validation process at the program review level. That's where their peers do the peer evaluation. The findings and initiatives and plans go forward to the wing planning councils. Those are those stru structural areas, student services and like. They have a full whole term to discuss these plans to help develop them out to better understand what's needed. They do the prioritization of those initiatives. That remember, we don't prioritize resources at Coastline, we prioritize initiatives. So we prioritize the initiatives at that level, take it up to our planning council level, do that college-wide planning summit so everybody's aware, and then do um, also um, discussion and, and planning at that level with those aggregate findings from the wing planning councils, which merge out of program review. And so and then it feeds up to the college, which then recommendations go to our president based on we think these are our priorities of our institution. And that's a cyclical process that occurs every year. So very quickly, if you don't mind, uh, Enrique, thank you. Uh, great question as, as always. Uh, very, very quickly, if you don't mind, uh, this is sort of like a logistical question. What's, what's up with the software? Uh, People always ask that question. I don't know. Maybe one day we are going to have a door standardized like Canvas is for distance ed. But uh, if you could have any, if, if you have any comments, your experience, any, any, any tips. I know that's the question that, that always someone asks and, and it just seems to be, uh, yeah, always, always there. So we would appreciate your insights. Well, I could just jump in there and say, really one of the things we want as and as a faculty member we want simplicity right we want something that's user friendly and uh, where you don't need to have a lot of technical skills and expertise and <laughs> and things we, we want it to be as simple as possible and um right right now what we our primary source of getting information about courses is through our learning management system which is desire to learn and we also use tableau to kind of help pull um, a lot of that data and we administer a lot of our, our surveys and things like that through Microsoft Forms and SurveyMonkey. So those are just like some of the tools we use. And, and we also use um, kind of SharePoint as kind of like this um, cloud source of accessing kind of some key information and submitting some reports. So those are just kind of some of the technologies we use, but at the core, what we're always craving is simplicity, ease of use, accessibility at the core. And, and I think to the point that you're making, it's the technology is not the solution. 
And I think that's the problem that all of our colleges are being sold is we have your ultimate solution. No, they don't. <laughs> and so I think that's the realities that we have to face is that, of course, we're going to hear that the solution is in your process. The solution is how, and if they have a mechanism that can create that, that you can utilize to help facilitate that process, then that's gold. And so let it be if you use Teams or Google um, Google uh, Docs, whatever you, you do, or if you use it, Lumen or whatever program platform you have, track that task stream, whatever you have. Once again, everything's going to have its, its quirks and its things. I think it goes right back to Tara's comment. Is it a barrier? Is it easy to use? Because, you know, mm -hmm. they're like, oh, just click these 5,000 things and look, everything's linked together. That's terrible. Like, I'll just straight up say, that's Word. That's a word. Just go back to Word documents. And so I think that's where some of the things were, how do we take the pain points out of it and really help faculty? Say if you do adopt um, a different platform, how does that enhance their experience of writing and collaborating program review? Okay. You know, and I think those are key areas. And like I said, it goes back to the process. What is your process like and how does it help facilitate that process? And and like I said, I, I know it's not a popular thing to say technology is not the solution, but it's, it's just legit not, so. That's exactly right. Very well said. Well, let's uh, conclude today's uh, discussion. Um, I'm going to stop the recording.